All right. Good morning and good evening. Good afternoon, wherever you're from. It's a little too early. I don't have the energy. I usually have to scream into the mic. But um, this is our final episode for this year's uh, Mentorship Monday. So if you're not familiar with Mentorship Monday, every Monday we come live to you guys on Twitch where we pick a topic and we bring industry experts, people that are known in the industry for that topic, and we get to pick their brains. Um, today's co-host is a little bit different. I actually have our producer on the stream today, <laughs> Nicole. Give us a quick intro. Who are you? What do you do with the HackerOne community? Yeah. So hi, everyone. Um, I'm fairly new to HackerOne. So I work on the community team for events. So ActivityCon, live hacking events, um, and behind the scenes producer. So you guys finally get to see the producer. So if you did watch the <laughs> activity, oh, I got to show my t-shirt. If you did watch the activity con uh, conference not too long ago, Nicole was a big part of it. Uh, and also our producer today is Ari. So Ari's in the chat dealing with everybody, but he's also our producer in the back. He's in our ear talking and telling us what to do and how to do our job better. But let's jump into today's topic. We are talking about mental health. What's the deal today, Nicole? Yeah, so we've got two amazing speakers. Uh, we've got Chloe Mastagi and Pamela Greenberg. Uh, they're both going to be talking about mental health and how to know signs of burnout and just all things mental health. You know, mental health is common with any industry, mental health issues and challenges. So we're going to learn a lot today from them. But before we bring on our guest, I have a quick announcement. Um, we are doing the 12 days of Hacky Holidays. So if you want to win some cash, there is up to $7,000 in cash prizes. There are a ton of Burb Suite certifications up for grab. Uh, one person is going to get sent to our next live hacking event. So if you want to come to the live hacking event that we're doing next at our um, fun location, whether it's virtual or in person, uh, this is your chance. If you want to play it, go to hackerone.com slash h1ctf. I'm putting the link right here. Just gonna point to it. Uh, go on that link, uh, play it. You're not late. There's 12 days of it. We're gonna go all the way till a couple of days before Christmas. There's also prizes for everybody. So if you are not the first to submit, the first 10 to submit the write-ups, get a bounty. Uh, if you make an automated report, you get a bounty. The most creative report gets a bounty. Um, there are tons of tons of different ways to win. So if you want to win some cash prizes before the holidays. This is your chance. And also, also one more thing, you get an invite. Every flag you find, if you submit to Hacker 101, equals one invite to a private program on Hacker 1. So you also could go and hack on bug bounties and make more money. We're good? All right. Yeah. You guys ready for our guest? Nicole, are you ready for our guest? I am. All right. Let's bring him on. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So I am very familiar with the two of you, but before we get started, can I get a quick round of intro? Uh, let's start with you, Pamela. Tell us who you are, what do you do, and why are you passionate about mental health? Um, sure. Uh, hi, my name is Pamela Greenberg, and I have been working at HackerOne for uh, about two and a half years. Uh, and I work on the people team, so I work with employees mostly, but um, in my previous career, I was actually a licensed marriage and family therapist, and I worked um, for about 10 years doing doing mental health work in uh, community-based mental health practices, and the last five and a half years of that working with young people uh, in the early stages of um, schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders, but I've worked with anxiety disorders and basically the whole gamut, and so mental health is a topic that is very important to me and something that I spent a big part of my career working directly with and still care a lot about. So what about you, Chloe? Um, so I'm the founder of Stand Out in Tech. Uh, basically, I'm an impact strategist and ESG researcher. I come into companies or organizations and try to improve their social, their environmental, and their governance practices. Um, and mental health has been something I've been speaking about and have had published works about for the past few years before the pandemic warning that organizations need to step up when it comes to mental health and putting mental health under a spotlight. And I still do this to this day. It's awesome. Yeah. So what made you guys get into this field and why is it so important to you? Oof. Um, big question. Yeah. <laughs> for, 
For me personally, uh, it has to do with my family. In fact, like I grew up in a family that had pretty active mental health problems. And so I grew up around it and, you know, we were always seeking therapy. And so it was part of my um, early life and existence. And so something we was talking, we were talking about and thinking about, it was part of my day to day. And so when it came time to kind of decide on a career, I think people often go with what they know and that happened to be something I knew a lot about and wanted to be helpful because therapy had been something that was really, really helpful to me at multiple points in my life. And so I wanted to be able to um, give that back to other people. I was obsessed with the brain since I can remember as a kid. And so I wanted to understand why people do what they do and understand more about how my brain functions. And then I just kind of went into InfoSec or cybersecurity, whatever way you want to call it. Um, I went into it and realized really fast there is a huge mental health problem in our industry. There is other industries that have mental health problems, but in our industry, we have quite a mental health problem. Yeah, I mean, um, I think mental health is just big in every industry, but with, with uh, I, I don't want to say cybersecurity, but with tech, it's a little bit more just because it's very repetitive, very goal-driven, very competitive, very, you know, whatever you want to attach to it. And I think the biggest, one of the biggest mental health issues that we see in our field is um, burnouts. Um, can you tell us a little bit, let's start with you, Chloe, can you tell us what that is, sure. um, you know, and what does it mean to be? You know, what is going to be burning out? Right. So burnout usually happens when we're not balancing our personal life and our work life. So if, if it's off, that means that burnout can occur. And you may notice that, for example, it used to take you a few minutes to respond to an email. Now it takes hours, maybe days, or you're pushing off special events or pushing deadlines <laughs> out. Uh, it's basically the sense that no matter how many hours of sleep that you get, you're still exhausted and I always put it in this way, the difference between stress and burnout is, for example, if I take a bubble bath, I may feel better. But if I took all the bubble baths in the world, it doesn't make me feel better. That's when I know I'm dealing with burnout. And burnout could come on very suddenly. Uh, research has shown that if you're in a non-leadership position, that within six months that you could develop burnout. And how that works is that usually you start with hope when you enter the job. Then you get into frustration, then anger, then apathy, and then we go into burnout. But I want to be clear that uh, burnout is very different from depression, but can become, if you don't treat burnout early on, it can mimic depression and anxiety symptoms. So it's really important that we start recognizing burnout really early on. Otherwise, we go into that issue of there and also our body starts taking on even more so with the, you know, the body aches, headaches, migraines, and you can also find yourself having some severe issues when it comes to your heart as well. Mm. Anything you may want to add, Pamela, anything that, um, is there any thing of like, any other ways of like realizing there's burnout or, you know, any experience yeah. of your own that you can add to that? Yeah, I think everybody is is fairly unique. So for some people, their symptoms might be primarily physical, might be the, the aches that uh, Chloe mentioned or the exhaustion. And for some people, it might be more um, cognitive. Probably for me personally, forgetfulness is a big one when I start to um, lose my keys and forget appointments and things that I'm usually pretty on top of. That's a sign to me that my, my brain is a bit overloaded. Um, for some people, it's social. You know, Maybe you're typically a very outgoing person and you become a bit more withdrawn. So it really depends. It can show up in different ways and it can be sort of insidious in that way in that there's not like a checklist. And if you have these things, you have burnout. You sort of have to know your fingerprint for what, what it shows up for as you. Yeah. yeah. So Pamela, you kind of just answered this, but Chloe, what are some things with yourself like that you'll notice for burnout that you kind of the signs? Yeah, I would say that I start having apathy. I start getting... Um, I start having apathy towards my job or what will end up happening is I get frustrated really bad. Um, but usually it just feels like I'm really, really, really tired. Like for me, the number one sign is I'm extremely tired and it's taking me way too long to respond to a very quick email. Usually for me, that immediately lets me know I'm overworking myself. I need to take a break. If not, this could become something more serious because I've dealt with burnout in the past it takes a long time to heal. It's not something overnight. It is something that can take a year or a couple of years sometimes, depending on the person. 
But for me, it's usually the tall tale sign is my email response rate. As you both saying these, I'm just like thinking about, so I, <laughs> I struggle with burning out a lot just because of, I try to do a lot of different things with life. As Chloe is saying the email thing, I'm sitting here like, oh, there are a few emails <laughs> I have to reply to. It takes me a while. And then the other one, the tiredness is very, very true. There's times when I, I sleep I, I sleep a lot. I, I'm not one of those people that gives up um, sleep for anything. I go to bed a lot around 11, 11.30. I wake up around 7, 7.30. I get my almost eight hours of sleep. But there's times when I wake up and I'm like, dude, why am I tired? Every night I've been going to bed pretty early and you know I'm not staying up late and I'm still tired. And then the forgetfulness is really, it's not so much forgetfulness either. It's forgetfulness and like confusion, if that makes sense. I'm like, um, why am I doing this thing? Like, why does this thing matter? What's the impact of like, why am I doing this, right? And never realizing um, it's a sign of being, you know, just tired of doing what I was doing or want to, wanting to take a break. So what did both of you do to avoid burnout? How do you kind of make sure that this doesn't happen? Prevention is key. And again, this is about knowing yourself and knowing what those things are that will keep that balance that Chloe mentioned. You know, that can be about your physical activity and exercise is really helpful. Having some kind of mindfulness practice is like crucial for some people if that's a, a thing that you cultivate. Um, nutrition, sleep, as Ben mentioned, like, there's a number of things you can do and they say prevention, you know, is a pound, uh, an ounce, ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So it's always best if you can build in those strategies before you hit the burnout point, because it does take a long time to recover. So anything you can do to maintain a healthy lifestyle and healthy attitude and notice the early warning signs as quick as possible. Yeah, I would, I would totally agree on that. I also do is journaling. I force myself to journal at least once a week. I know some people, they journal every day. Cool. That's great. You can do that. I don't have that time sometimes. <laughs> but the whole just keeping in touch with yourself and journaling, I find that I'll, I'll go over other entries. And if I start seeing like this feeling of trapped or hopelessness or uh, like you're just drowning in work or drowning in something, I make note of that. So when you are journaling, it's good to also go back in the previous ones to see how you're doing. But if you're one of those people that also like, as she was saying, some gratitude does help. It gets you in that positive mood. And that's the whole thing, right? When we're trying to run, when we're having mental health problems, a lot of times it's because we're hopeless. We don't have, we don't have faith in what's going on in our life or we don't have positivity around us. So I highly recommend this. It's a five minute journal. Um, this is really helpful. So like I have like, I'm grateful for, if you can see. So oh. you do it twice. Oh my God, this is bad. Okay. So you do it <laughs> twice a day. You do it first thing in the morning when you wake up, don't look at your phone. That's the first thing I will tell you. Don't look at your phone right when you wake up. That definitely helps prevention. Um, and then right before bed, you list what are three amazing things you happen in the day some takeaway. And then if you are having trouble struggling on what to do with your day, I use a productivity planner. Um, and so this lets me know what I need to be doing and how to do better. And I find this to be less stressful when I, when I have things planned out. So those are two things that really help me out to reduce burnout. The phone thing is, I am so bad about first thing in the morning all before bed and I know it's awful. I, I, I gotta work on it, so. What about you, Pamela? For things that I do to, to maintain yeah. my balance? Um, well, I happen to be on vacation right now and I think it's really important. <laughs> <laughs> it's important to plan those breaks and time off and, and I think to be gentle with yourself. Nicole, even what you said, like, oh, I'm really bad at that. Like the more we pile on and beat ourselves up for things, like we're never gonna be perfect and, and giving mm -hmm. ourselves that allowance that like, it's okay to have an off day. It's okay to not be your best all the time. Nobody is their best all the time. Yeah. And so, you know, being gentle with yourself and it's a, is a practice that I try to cultivate personally. The phone thing, Chloe, I think it was at Naham Khan when you talked about the phone thing. I started charging my phone in my kitchen now just mm -hmm. because there was a time, I don't want to talk about what the incidents was, but I woke up to a tweet that was at me and it was, uh, it was very, very upsetting and sad. And then it just, it didn't, the, the thing that they told me to didn't affect me. It was just like, I didn't want to wake up to it in the morning. So I just 
plug my phone in either in my bathroom or in my kitchen. But the journal thing, I want to add one more thing before we move on to the next question. Um, I saw this quote that said, like, if you have an experience or a bad memory in your body, the best way to get it out of your system is to write it all down. And I never, I, I try to do the journal thing. It's, you know, it's not a habit that I have. I, I try once in a while. I have a, it's called Better Every Day, I think is what it's called, the journal that I bought. It gives you a prompt about growth, self-awareness, whatever. Like every month it's a different theme. But just writing that down and getting it out of your system is the best way I think to deal about things. I'm not a person that really wants to talk about a lot of personal stuff. So just writing it down has been very helpful. And that, that quote was probably what really, made sense to me just getting out of your system you know it's just talking to someone but sometimes you don't want to talk to people right not everyone likes to open up to other people um so writing it down is definitely definitely helpful yeah it kind um, of empties out that part of your brain so you can focus on all the other things but yeah talking about it writing it these are all things that are really positive in the end um what was the second notebook that you showed to us close someone in the chat oh to you. um it's so it's by the same company intelligent change so this one is Productivity Planner. There we go, okay. Um, yeah, I think both of them were about 25 or 30 bucks, but they nice. last for all, like almost a whole year. Yeah. But I find this really easy for me, uh, especially if I'm on the road or when I was traveling, it was really helpful because you don't have to bring your actual journal if you don't want to, you just bring that and it's five minutes. There's even a one minute journal. Um, it's called Keel's Diary. It's K-E-E-L-S. Uh, and that's a one minute uh, diary that you do at any time, but usually you want to do it at the end of the day. So that's another option. So if you're trying to journal every day, that might be a good way too. you get to learn a little bit about yourself. Uh, so you both mentioned productivity a lot when we we're talking about burnout. Um, how does that affect productivity? It's not just, you know, not with just work, but in all aspects of life, how does burnout uh, affect, you know, being productive and getting things done. Let's talk, let's start with you, Pamela. Oh, it affects it negatively. I, I think you can imagine when people are feeling this combination of physical and mental um, exhaustion and uh, off their A game, it's really hard to be productive. And I think especially in our like fast paced, always on world and there's things coming at you from every direction, you know, at a certain point you just shut off. And I think it's, it's a massive cost to companies, you know, pretty much in every industry that when people get burned out, they're not able to produce anymore. It's sort of like when an athlete hits that wall, they can't keep going. There's no extra tank to push past it. They need to take time. Um, and so that's, that's a loss to productivity. And so it's so much better to pace oneself and really be able to, to continue to perform you know, in a reasonable way than to push really hard and, and get to a point where productivity just completely bottoms out. Yeah, I've, I've tried that whole thing. Like when I'm burned out, I still keep pushing myself. And let me tell you, the creativity is gone. Like productivity is out the window. I'm getting sick often. I'm like, it's so much better to just deal with it. Um, but I wanted to just add on to Pamela's thing, which is there was a study that showed how do people get burned out in organization. And a lot of times people think it's because they're overloaded with work. It is not true. The first one is poor leadership. Poor leadership will hands down cause that. The lack of organization caring is the second one. The third is the role of other workers. So if, if other workers are gossiping or not helpful or sabotaging, that's gonna become a problem. The fourth one is politics and sabotage. And it, there's the list keeps going and on, but I wanna say out of the 10, when it comes to work overload, that's number seven. So just think about it that way. It's not about the amount of work that you're doing because when you're passionate, you're going to do it. It's more about do you have support? Do you feel like you're being appreciated and recognized for your talents? If you don't, you may leave at the end of the day or you may get fired, which is something that we see that's very common. And, mm -hmm. and a control, I think, is a big issue too. And that's part of poor leadership is that if people feel like they don't have a lot of control in their work, if they're constantly just taking orders and not you know, able to think for themselves or, or speak up and say what, what they need or what their priorities maybe should be, that can be a big factor as well. So making sure you have a good relationship with whoever you're working with so that you can voice your own needs. What would you recommend that a company or industries could do to promote mental health and prevent this burnout? What are some techniques that they should apply? I think the first step is talking about it. I think, you know, we need to move out of the world where we pretend that 
that this isn't an issue or that there are some, this happens to some people, but not everybody. Like we all have the capacity for these, um, for these levels of burnout. And so we need to make sure that it's on our minds and that managers are more equipped to ask questions and notice when they see little changes so that we can catch things again before they reach the point of, you know, someone needs to take uh, a year of leave to, to really work on their mental health. There are ways to to be addressing it as you go so that it never reaches that point. But I think the first step, for, as with any problem, is to admit that, mm -hmm. you know, we are vulnerable. Like we, yeah. we have this and we need, we need help from each other. Yeah, I would say to add on to that, it really depends on who's on the board and who's on your C-level. Because if they're having politics and sabotaging happening around them or they're micromanaging, that's going to trickle down throughout the company. So it's really important is to really research when you're looking at companies, how does the board work? How does the C-level work? What's their personality like? Are they, are they all about wanting to see the person that's reporting to them go beyond them? Great. But if there's someone who's like, I'm scared of you and your abilities and I'm worried you're going to take my seat, then that's not going to be a good work environment. So it's always that is one of the major ones. And I would say also, you know, diversity equity and inclusion. You have to have that. If you don't have that, anyone who's marginalized is not going to feel included. And when they don't feel included, they don't have autonomy. Like Pamela mentioned earlier, if you don't feel like you have any power or say and you're voiceless, you're going to get burned out and you're going to have to face some serious consequences in that organization. And the problem is, is that if we don't if we don't try to fix this problem, we're going to continue to have a rotating door in our industry. People don't just leave companies. They're also leaving industry because it's become so bad. And that's when we go into that burnout and PTSD part. Um, I like what you, you said, Pamela, about the, the manager, you know, having a manager that knows how to do these things. Um, when I was going through some stuff, one of my favorite things with my former uh, manager Luke, who's no longer a hacker, one was he would just start off the meeting with, "How has Ben doing? Like, how are you doing this week?" Or you know, what's you know, it 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 didn't, it wasn't that I would actually talk about what was going on, but it was just the idea that he didn't care to start off with work, they didn't want to jump in right into like what's going on with work, and he really asked me, like, "How are you doing today? Like, what do you you know? How are you feeling? Do you need time?" And making me feel like it's okay to not want to take time off and you know, making me feel okay that I want to take time off or I can take a mental health day or that, you know, I can talk to him about that kind of stuff. So the manager thing is definitely a big part, not just managers, you know, also coworkers of mine that would, that would do that. They would ask me like, hey, you don't seem like you're being yourself recently. Are you okay? And ask me those questions would make me think and, you know, uh, reflect to make sure I am mentally doing okay. Yeah. I think just the environment who you work with is a very, very uh, big part of it. Yeah, and it's such a simple invitation, right, to just say to somebody, hey, there's space here for you to talk if you want to. And like you said, like, even if you didn't take the space, just knowing it was there is in and of itself meaningful. So I think, unfortunately, you know, to Chloe's point, depending on what the culture in an organization is, not every manager feels they have permission to do that, even if they may have the instinct to do it. Mm -hmm. And so knowing that there's an institutional value placed on looking at a whole person and not treating people like work output machines, because they're not. They never will be, no matter how much you try and treat them that way. So making room for them to be a full person is really important. And I think, you know, for, for people who are looking for a job, interviewing is a two-way street. And it's really important to sort of probe for those kinds of things and make sure that you're coming into a culture where, you know, where something as simple as a manager starting with, how are you doing? Which, I mean, I know yeah. that sounds like unbelievably simple, but it, it makes a big difference. I think it's also just hard to do that from a manager's perspective, right? If you don't lucky for me luke and i had that relationship for him to feel comfortable enough to ask me but i also think like a new manager sometimes is going to be a lot harder right but i think i would encourage it you know if anybody watching this you are a people's person you're a manager um asking that you know i think makes a huge difference for your for your team and people that report to you yeah. um I see the chat is already ahead of me with imposter yeah. syndrome, so I'm just going to dive right <laughs> into it. Can you tell us what imposter syndrome is? Let's start with you, Chloe. What is imposter syndrome? Ooh, that's that a good question, this. but I think Pamela would probably be a better fit on that one. <laughs> Jump to Pamela then. Sure, what is, it's, uh... It is exactly what it sounds like. It is this sort of uh, gnawing, pervasive, anxious feeling that one is... Um, is not where you know not equipped to be where they are. That people see you as something that you internally feel that you might be an imposter. That um, that you're being 
trusted with too much or given too much responsibility and that ultimately you're not capable and you're going to fail and not believing in yourself. It's like a very extreme version of not believing in yourself and feeling, in fact, like you don't even belong where you are. Um, and it can really undermine people's confidence and their ability to do things they are capable of. Just, you know, that m mind over matter thing, like we can do incredible things if we believe it, but also if we don't believe it, we can, we can really create self-fulfilling prophecies around it. Yeah, I've definitely struggled with this one. And I always have thought, oh, I'm just a perfectionist. That's what it is. But I've Perfectionism, definitely, yeah. Yeah, definitely experienced this. What is, so what is your advice for dealing with imposter syndrome? How do you handle it? Gosh, I think it's another one that helps to have that self-awareness first and, and have people that you trust that you can talk to. Because the, the poorly kept secret about it is everybody feels it. Like it, it can feel when you're in it that you feel it and everybody else knows exactly what they're doing and you are the only one who doesn't belong, but that truly is not the case. And even the people that you admire and look up to have experienced this. And I think the more we can talk about it and more normalize it, it's, it's really, um, it's sort of like a, a pressure release valve right away to go, oh my gosh, it's not just me. I'm not alone with this. It's not just in my head. Yeah, you can also do is what I, uh, when I was on the road, there's times where I would feel inadequate and so to gain my confidence before I get on stage or after stage or anything like that, giving talks, I would have an index card with any achievements that I've done and to remind myself, hey, if I could do that, I could certainly do this too. Um, I think reminding yourself what you've achieved in life is really good. So you graduate from high school. That's a big deal. You graduate from college. That's a big deal. Uh, if you've gone through a, situ a hard situation like a breakup and now you're like living the life, that's a big deal. These are things to just remember. Um, you've accomplished stuff already. Just remind yourself that you can accomplish something else. I think talking about it itself has been one of the most helpful things that I have done to deal with. Imp I struggle with it on a regular basis, maybe on a daily basis. Um, life hacking events i go to these amazing events that we put together and there's all these like very good you know amazing hackers that are very good at what they do and you just sit in the middle of the room and you go i don't belong here like what am i doing here right <laughs> go to these conferences you know i i talked at this conference i come off the stage and i go to the next talk and i go whoa what was i talking about <laughs> this is way cooler way better right but just talking about it so i um when i do my I do the Sunday streams, I used to at least for a while, where I would bring on a lot of hackers um, and I would interview them. And then at the end, I always ask about imposter syndrome and burning out. The imposter syndrome one is the, my, I think it's everyone's favorite segment because it, it's humanizing people that no matter where you are in life, you know, no matter how, if you're looking up to people or people looking up to you, you still deal with imposter syndrome. I, uh, don't know. I still don't know how to deal with it a lot of times, but I also remind myself, you know, people are people are coming to watch the, you know, the talk that we were mentioning, Chloe. They're coming to you to watch your talk because you have done something that they, you know, they want to hear from you. With the streams, are days when I sit right here in the camera without going live, and I go, I shouldn't do this. I shouldn't go live, and then I go, no. There's like people that are waiting. There's a reason why people are waiting, and then just reminding myself of like that I've done some stuff to deserve to be here, even though I may not fully believe in it. But talking about it has made it a lot easier to just, you know, not worry about it as much. I've just, it's become a part of my personality and life. It's just how to handle it now at this point. It's also social media promotes this too, by the way. Mm -hmm. Like if you start seeing yourself comparing yourself to other people, you need to take a break. I think that's the one thing I recognized during the whole pandemic was that social media could be a source of good but it could be also a very bad source for your mental mm -hmm. health. So taking breaks out, totally okay. It's okay to do that. No one's gonna bat their eye because they're all thinking about doing it too at some point. So just keep that in mind when you compare yourself. Yeah, that, that feeds into the imposter syndrome a bit. Also remind yourself that like people post their highlight the best parts their, yep. the best parts yep. of their life on social media I'm, i don't know I, th I don't know if you guys see my instagram but i've tried to do the opposite on instagram when i post a lot of the struggles that i go through i want people to see like the stuff that i do on twitter the you know the corporate person that i am or whatever i do in my life the industry person is not always the same as my personal life mm -hmm. but i also want to add a note to what close about comparison i think comparison is healthy when you're drawing inspiration 
but not comparing and telling yourself like, oh, so-and-so is younger than me, but they're ahead of me in life, or so-and-so is doing the same thing as I am better. That's not the right way to do it, but drawing inspiration is a very good way to do it. Also compare yourself. This is one of the biggest things for me that's helped me get through a lot of things, especially this year, was comparing myself to six months ago and a year ago today was the biggest thing. I go and you know, I, I read some of the stuff that I've written down. I read some of my emails that I've sent out. And you can see the anger sometimes in the emails last year. People may not notice it, but I know this is not how I attack an email. This is not how I respond to my friends. And comparing myself to a year ago, I go, oh, my God, like, it's only been a year. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I, I think know. growth mindset is really important in all of this too. Like people are resilient. Like we are. Mm -hmm. Look at all that we've just, all of us survived in the last year and a half alone. <laughs> So it's a good thing to remember. And the, the idea of growth mindset is that we don't have a fixed potential. It's not like once you get to your level, that's it. And that's the best you'll ever be. If you keep working and keep trying, and, and as you said, Ben, like looking for inspiration and not, you know, compare and despair, but, you know, striving and looking at every setback as an opportunity to learn and every mistake or every piece of feedback you get as something that's going to spur you to, to more and to better, like that attitude and that mindset makes a huge difference. And, and the, the book uh, Mindset by Carol Dweck, I would highly recommend as it really talks about how to cultivate that and what the importance and those all kinds of clinical studies that are really interesting about um, how that impacts people on their performance. It's called Mindset? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll check I have it out. To, I have to remind myself very often when I'm on social media that this is just snippets of people's life. They've probably set up this photo and posed it and there is a mess in the room behind them. Yeah. yeah. Don't compare true. your middle to someone else's end, right? Oh, like yeah. they're showing you a finished product and you're in the middle of your own no. progress. So no. it's not a fair comparison. It's not. No. Um, I think you're up, Nicole. This is you. Well, no, this so, is me. Hold on. I'm sorry. I conclude. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what are some... Um, so this conversation like completely, like it went a lot further than I expected it. So it kind of threw me... I tracked. <laughs> We well, forgive the opportunity to recover and to be gentle with ourselves and keep going. Yeah. So with just uh, with you know mental health, what are some activities you recommend to people um, that helps you know kind of ground yourself, get better, or deal with you know whatever mental health issues you're going through, whether it's burning out, imposter syndrome, depression, anxiety. Um, what are some things you do maybe daily or you know you recommend to people to do regularly? Let's start with you, Pamela. I mean, I know this sounds boring, but really the basics, get enough sleep and work on your sleep hygiene if that's an issue, eat healthy foods, take care of your body. Like, you know, we are biological, we need food, we need in, uh, sleep, we need relaxation and downtime, like we can't just be going all the time. And then never be afraid to ask for help, you know, find who you trust, never be afraid to ask for professional help. I know that there's been a lot of stigma and shame around that. And obviously I'm biased because I was a therapist for 10 years, but we're really not that scary. There's a lot of people out there who, who can help. There's free services. Um, there's online services. Like there's so many ways to reach out and get support. And there's really no shame. It's the strongest thing you can do is reach out and ask for help when you need it. Yeah, she kind of nailed that. I don't really know what else to say, but go seek help if you need to. There's also support groups that you can join, like anxiety, depression, burnout circles. So you can join that. Uh, meditation was another one and yoga for some, but working out definitely helps. You don't have to, you know, work out for, you know, an hour. You could just do 10 minutes. You could just dance in your room and then boom, you feel a little bit better afterwards. Endorphins. So, yep. There's actually really good research that for mild to moderate depression, uh, meditation and exercise was as effective as um, medication as antidepressants. So it, it works. They've re researched it. It's real. Yeah. I think walking was a, you know, I know exercise is, in, it's, you know, walking is a part of, but walking alone has been a very, very helpful one for me. I mean, right now it's kind of harder with the rain, but that um, was when, when Nicole and I were supposed to host ActivityCon. The night before, I was so anxious. I had to just go around the block like twice. <laughs> I just go walk twice around the block and go home. I think the night before activity con, I walked like I counted eleven or twelve times. <laughs> but after the twelfth time, I was like, okay, this, I'm not anxious anymore. I'm done. I'm better now. Uh, walking has been a very, very good one. Like, even with with work, when I'm stressed and I need a break quickly, I can't go to the gym and I don't want to work out. I just literally go downstairs, put my shoes on, just two minutes, even three minutes around the block. It's been a very, very um, good way of 
getting things out of your system and just feeling better. And also it helps you. I think it helps you work things out in your brain as you're walking. I try to leave my phone behind or put it on like not disturb, for example, and have music in the background. Yeah. It's kind of funny how the, the more under stress or in burnout we get, the more we move away from the things that are good for us. Like you said, like sometimes it's hard to go to the gym when you're feeling down, but that's the time when you most need it. And so having those strategies, Ben, I think is so useful. Have your shoes right by the door, like lower the barrier, make it as easy as possible to do the things that you know are good for you, even though your, you know, your brain when it's not in its best place might, might tell you to just crawl back, you know, under a blanket um, when you know yeah. that actually connecting with other people or getting a little exercise is, is better. So something that I'm wondering is if you guys have a daily morning routine that you go through and does it help you to have this routine and have everything kind of set up that you're going to do every day? Do you think that's beneficial? Pamela, you can go first. I do. I, I am not always excellent at it, but I am a list person. <laughs> so yeah. I try to, I try to start my day with a list of like, these are the things that I have to get done today. And then sometimes like some bonus things that if I can get to them, like major pat on the back, um, but if I don't get them, that's fine. I put a little arrow and put them to my next day. And I just get a lot of satisfaction crossing things off of my list. So I find that practice to be very um, satisfying. What about you, Chloe? Um, well, I'm not always great at it either. Mm -hmm. But when I do, I definitely notice a huge difference. And it's one of those things where you're self-sabotaging yourself by not doing it. Mm -hmm. um, so usually what I do is when I wake up, the first hour is for myself. So that means like I will do the five minute journal first thing in the morning while I'm making my tea. It'll be petting my puppies, hanging out with my pups, um, be reading the news. I usually try not to check my email or social media when I, in that first hour, but there are times where I fail, not gonna lie. Mm -hmm. um, and then I usually do a yoga stretches for about 10 minutes before I do any calls. That gets me kind of in that, that mood um, to go ahead and have that optimistic uh, lookout for the day. But like Pamela mentioned earlier um, about making a list and crossing things out, I'm also the same way. So in my productivity, when I'm done, check mark or it'll be a cross off. And I also have like post-its where I'll write things down that I need to get done first thing. I am with you with the post-its, Chloe. Yep, I have yeah. a, I have a, I have a wall next to my bed that I every every Sunday I put posters of things I have to do every day. And it's like three categories. They're three different colors. Uh, I don't want to show my to-do list, but well, let me make sure I have them back. Okay, so I have three different colors. Uh, personal work and personal work. Like the, my band stuff that I do That's... on my own. And it's been very helpful. But you said you do this. I want to talk about the one hour thing. Have you heard of the Miracle Morning? The book? No, I have not. So what you describe is literally what the book describes into doing. Um, I think we lost Pamela for a second, but she's going to come oh. back, I think. But... Uh, the author of the book talks about how he went through really, he, he got into his car accident. You know, he was almost paralyzed. His wife left him or girlfriend left him, whatever. And he wanted to get out of it. So he came up with this daily routine. It was one hour. He does uh, six things. It's called the lifesavers. It's silence. He sits in silence for five minutes and just thinks about what he wants to do for that, that day. He has uh, affirmation when he, you know, writes down what he wants to accomplish, you know, affirming whatever, uh, visualizing things of how he wants to get it done, whether it's today, next month, next year. He says exercise for 30 minutes, either go jog or 20 minutes, jog, um, go to the gym, whatever it is. you want to do yoga. Um, and the silence thing could also be meditation, by the way. Then he talks about reading. He just says, hey, sit down and read for 10 minutes. You know, just read something that's going to get you going. That was a really helpful one for me. And then uh, he says to write down, because uh, I don't know what the word for us for the S one, but he just pretty much says to journal for a couple of minutes of like get everything out of your way or plan your day, whatever to just write some stuff down. That's why I was asking because you mentioned um, yeah, that sounds almost a T what I do. <laughs> it's called a lifestyle, which you definitely look it up. If anybody um, wants to look at it, it's called uh, the Miracle Morning. I'll put it in the chat to um and um it's a very it's literally what you mentioned and it's i don't do all of them anymore every day it, i did it for a month i would wake up at 6 30 i would sit on my couch and do all these things for an hour then it got exhausting became a chore for me yeah so now i do a bunch of these in different ways like the gratitude thing that you mentioned i just remind myself to stop complaining because my life's not that bad to complain about things um and then like the journaling thing i'll try and do once in a while but exercising reading 
uh, has been a big one to do every day. Yeah, no, that gratitude stuff really does help, especially if you do it like first thing in the morning, three things, and then right before bed, three things. Uh, it's really helpful. Um, there is a, this, this is the something that I brought up before we were getting on the stream. So I was telling you that I have this little voice in my head that tells me, you know, I take a day off. I took yesterday off, for example. I didn't stream. I didn't work. I just went out with friends, had a good time. I had Sunday, fun day, whatever you want to call it. But at the end of the day, I felt guilty that I didn't do any work. I didn't do any of my work that I had planned. Um, and I just felt really bad. Do you deal with that yourself when you take yeah. you, you have that guilt of like oh, not yeah. working? I think for me, giving, granting myself permission to have the day off is now much easier. I would say it took like a year to get there. Um, yeah. And I think that's because uh, our society, and I, I know in like culture wise, like in Persian culture, it's like constantly you want to be the best that you can possibly be in your career. It's something that's very much ingrained. And so I think also in society wise, we have been celebrating workaholics in a sense. And so if we're not doing something, we start feeling guilty. And the same thing we have with burnout is that we start feeling guilty and trapped because we're not taking the time out to be there with our friends, taking a phone call, texting someone back. And it isn't because we're, we're too busy to, it's just because we're afraid that we're going to take on more things. Because sometimes when we're talking to family or friends, it's also us having to listen to their situations. It also means maybe having to pick up a task to help them out. When in reality, if you're burned out or dealing with a mental health issue, it's so important to take care of yourself first. You cannot take care of another human being in the way that you want to, to be supportive if you yourself aren't doing well. And I think that's a really hard concept to grasp. But it is one of the reasons why, for example, if I'm on a plane and, you know, when they're giving you the instructions, mm -hmm. you know, before you put the air mask on, please help the person next, uh, like put it on first on you, then yeah. help the next person. It's that same belief. We have to do better on that. I think it's also a part of the the hustle culture and, you know, the grind culture, the no day. I, I'm a big, like I I do the same stuff of saying no days off sometimes when I'm, you know, completely focused. And I think doing too much of that and getting too used to working is what also gets you to feel very unproductive or you know, very you know guilty when you're unproductive and just yeah. reminding yourself that you've worked six days a week or um, you deserve having a day off. It's been very hard when I, you know, yesterday I was just, I came on, I was like, nope, I'm very disappointed. Like I could have done all these things with my day. And so I went out and like wasted a whole day. Then I realized, oh, you know, it's just one day. I work six days of the week. So like one day isn't going to kill me, you know, or taking two days isn't going to kill me. Yeah. It's something you also see in like anxiety. So with anxiety, you're constantly like, oh my God, if I'm not doing this, I'm doing something terrible. I'm failing this person. I'm failing that person. So anxiety kicks in. But also the thing is to note is that that's definitely a sign of depression too. Um, so signs of depression for anyone who doesn't know is the feeling of sad or having a depressed mood, uh, a loss of interest or pleasure in activities once you enjoyed, change in appetite such as a weight loss or weight gain, um, also trouble sleeping or sleeping too much, loss of energy or increased fatigue, um, increase in purposeless activity. So for example, like you may be having problems with speech here and there, or even doing basic things. Um, feeling worthless or guilty is one of those main symptoms too, because you start getting depressed uh, if you're not doing the things that you used to do or enjoy or not being there for people. And you have difficulty thinking or concentrating or making decisions. So the thing is like burnout is, is one of those things that can transition to depression um, if you don't get it treated. Um, but you want to make sure that you also catch these symptoms too. And yeah. I know that right now with the pandemic, you're seeing more and more folks dealing with uh, anxiety and depression symptoms more than ever before around the world. And that's because we just, the pandemic, it's, it's one of those things we don't know when it's going to end. And because we don't have control of that, this can start spearing uh, towards depression and anxiety. Yeah. So something uh, you touched on a little bit earlier, but, what if someone, you know, wants to talk to a professional and maybe they're intimidated or maybe they don't have the money or where can they go to seek help and what can they do? 
Yeah. Um, so it depends on where you are located, but right. there are apps um, that have uh, telehealth services. Um, that's one to look into. Also your health insurance, you can contact them saying that you need to get, uh, you want to see a therapist or see a psychiatrist. Yeah. Um, I highly recommend first reaching out about seeing a therapist because a therapist can let you know if you need further um, help or assistance. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Now, therapists are there to listen and to help you on your journey to discovering some deep things so then you can uh, work through trauma because a lot of the reasons we have these mental health issues is because of traumatic events in our life. Mm -hmm. And so that is one thing is to focus on getting the therapy. And if you are like scared to go get help, that's okay. That is normal. But the thing is, if you wait for too long, you get to develop other things that now you may need further help. So by seeing a therapist now, it may prevent you seeing a psychiatrist that might prevent you from being on any medication. So this is why we want to get to it as soon as possible, because the longer we let it sit in us, that's a problem. Also, the fact that we impact each other. So if we're not recognizing that we're impacting another person because of our mental health, that becomes a hard problem too. And I know that for some people, it's very hard to convince loved ones to go and see a therapist. That's another hard uh, situation too. Yeah, I think understand that there are professionals out there to help you for a reason. It's the biggest thing. I think a lot of people have a problem with not only opening up to someone, but also the stigma around mental health and talking to a professional. Um, I don't understand why, but I think you're absolutely right. Going to a therapist prevents a lot of different things. And uh, anyone listening, then if you need help, I think you should seek for it. It's the only, you know, you got to help yourself. Um, no one else is going to be able to help you out unless you take those steps yourself. Mm -hmm. um, the last thing I wanted to ask, I wish we had Pamela here for, uh, I think mm -hmm. she would have had a um, good outlook on that last question, but I don't think she's going to make it. The last thing I want to ask you, um, Chloe, is just do you, have any charities or organizations that be able to help with these kinds of things that you recommend or part of your advocate for uh, that people could go and look into it either to get help or if they want to support and donate to that you recommend? Oh, that's a good one. I didn't research that one. <laughs> Mental but health I know is a big one, I think. The Trevor Project is a good one right now. They could really use some assistance. Um, yeah, they, they work with with LGBTQ plus um, and providing mental health services, but also support because a lot of times when people come out, um, they may not get support from friends and family anymore and they're kind of isolated and alone. Um, and so it's, it's one of those things that that's a good organization to get involved with or to, you know, fundraise for. Yeah. Um, I don't think there are any questions in the chat. I think we did a pretty good job of keeping up with them. Um, anything you would like to add before we say goodbye to you? Um, anything yeah. you want, you know, any advice, any last minute you, know, you want to add anything to this? Yeah, uh, I will leave it on a positive note. But first, just want to let people know that right now there's been a lot of conversations about burnout and PTSD. Um, and I just want to quickly go over those so then people are aware if they need to get help or not immediately. So the thing is, it's very similar, like really similar. So burnout and PTSD, the symptoms are exposure to trauma or extreme stressor can cause a reaction. You can respond with fear, hopelessness, or horror. You can have sleep disturbances and nightmares, depression or withdrawal, mood changes and generalized irritability. You avoid activities that promote recall of traumatic event. If you are one of those folks that's dealing with burnout and you also just heard these symptoms and you connect with them, it's also good for you to go and get checked out. PTSD is something that is pretty rampant right now. Uh, we also have post-COVID stress disorder, which is connected to anything around the pandemic that may have caused you to have PTSD around it. So go and if you have any of the symptoms, do get help. It is so important to go see a therapist. And I think almost everyone should have a therapist at all times. So in case if you need to talk to someone, there's someone there. Sometimes you can't uh, share certain things with friends and family. That's better to do with the therapist because they've been uh -huh. trained to guide you. 
Um, but just note that things are going to get better. So if you're feeling like, oh, the Omicron is here, it, things are never going to get better. It's going to be like this forever. Let's be honest with each other. It's not going to be forever. And it will get better. And it just, just be patient, be cognizant of yourself, have awareness of what you're doing and how you're impacting others, how others are impacting you. And really dive in and see what are the things you really want in life. This is that time to have a moment of breathe, like breather and, and just like, just really think what is missing in my life? What do I want to change? Because this is that time that you do that. So instead of seeing it as a negative situation where you feel trapped and everything, look at it as this is a changing moment in my life. This is the moment where I figure out what is needed in my life and make it about that. Don't make it about things are never going to end. Just be like, what do I want to change in my life? And then work at that and get help and ask people, how do I get here? Because people are happy to help most of the time. Well said. There's one more question I just came in that I wanted to ask. What would you tell someone who's feeling burnout, but yes, but yet they still have responsibilities for doing things? And if you can't take time off, then you just, you know, have to power through it. First, I've been there before. I have done that many, many times in my life. And the one thing that I have to tell you is that you're going to keep going through these routines and these cycles until you break it. And the way how you break it is first, congrats, you've recognized you're burned out. That takes a lot, by the way. Not everyone notices that they're burned out. They just think that something's wrong. And sometimes they don't even notice at all. And they self-medicate. Congrats that you know that you're burned out. I would say that what you want to do is figure out what life changes are needed at this time. Is it just something that's happening at your company? Is it the job itself that's causing you to feel burned out? Or is it the industry? Maybe it's time to change your industry. Overall, it's a time for you to really discover what do you need to change? Because if you don't change anything, and if you go to one company to another in the same role, but you're still burned out, that means that you didn't change something. So you want to break the cycle by noticing what will make you happy. Yeah. And don't deny that and just go for it. So that means right now, look for other roles. I always tell people, if you're burned out at a company and they're not supporting you or they can't give you any time off, you're going to cause a bad situation for yourself and for your team. So if they don't care about that, then that's a company you don't want to work for. So go and look elsewhere while you're still employed so you can still get your pay and then move. And that might be, that's a decision for you is to think, do I want to be in the same job or do I want to go in a different type of job? Or do I want to leave the industry? And that's the thing you have to ask yourself. And I think just breaking that cycle is really important. And just, yeah, that changes. It's, I think that's the one thing I've heard you say within all the questions. It's just understanding what there is and that needs to be changed. And taking it, you know, taking matters in your own hand and making those changes. Um, I think that's it. Nicole, do you have any other questions? No. Um, it was really helpful, though, all the information and... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to start a morning routine. I'm inspired. <laughs> <laughs> Just it's don't awesome. force it on yourself. Right. That's the one thing. Give, yeah. It's okay to not do it once in a while. And it's all you right. You make it a chore. Yeah. I think once yeah. it becomes a chore and then you start getting upset it's at yourself, it just kind of, yeah. you know, defeats the purpose, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I think now is a good time too with the, the new year coming. You know, everyone sets their resolutions. And I think we should do monthly resolutions though. So then we're always... <laughs> You know, we're always kind of pushing for better and not just once a year. Yeah. Well, if you want to start a new routine, it takes 21 yeah. days, people. 21 days. Yeah. Just remember that. Well, Chloe, thank you so much for uh, – thanks to you and bo Pamela both. Un unfortunately, we lost Pamela halfway through. But, you know, it's still – grateful that we had her here and thank you so much for being here and you know being honest and you know open with us and helping us out with uh, mental health i think it's a big topic that needs to be discussed more and i really appreciate you every time you have done a talk we've always reached out like hey can you help us with the mental health stuff and you've always been uh, really happy to do so i want to just say i appreciate that and thank you so much for being a part of the stream excellent thank you so much for having me and you know happy holidays to everyone and it's always a pleasure Anytime Thank you guys you. need me, let me know. <laughs>
what you thought it might. We will. (laughs) We'll talk soon, Chloe. Thank you so much. All right. Okay. Bye. See ya. Bye. All right. That's it. Last reminder. Do you have any announcements to call before I wrap us up and go on with my announcements? I don't think so. Should I have any announcements? Um, I'll do the announcement then. Reminder, okay. 12 days of hockey holidays. If you want to win some cash prizes, go to hackerone.com slash h1-ctf. $7,000 in prizes. Invite to a live hacking event. Uh, vouchers, swag, invites to private programs, you name it. Even if you find one flag, you still get one invite. Just remember that. You want to do more, you get more flags and more invites. And two, with the holidays coming up, uh, for the next two weeks will be or three weeks we're not going to be doing any mentorship mondays anymore uh we're going to go on a quick break uh me ari and nicole are going to take a break from doing these streams but we promise we'll be back in a few weeks and we're going to have more guests more amazing topics and we're going to keep on going more swag more giveaways and uh hopefully ari can you know, tell us how old he is and back in his days, how he handled things. More joke for us. <laughs> but other than that, thank you guys so much. Thank you, Nicole, for being an amazing co-host and doing this with me. I appreciate it. Just everyone we'll remember, see. stay kind to one another and you're not alone. We'll see you all in a few weeks. Bye. Bye.